Sure. Oh, there he is. Hey, Bob. Hey, David. Okay. Uh, this is Lauren this week. Tisha's still there out, is. so uh, hey, Lauren. she'll let us she'll <clears throat> let us know when we're live. All right. We'll let you know momentarily. Okay. Thanks. I got a topic list and uh, I'm not going to throw anything unexpected at you. All right. All right. Uh, I believe we are live. Are we live? Not yet. No. I'll, I'll let you know in chat. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Prospect Weekly Roundup. I'm David Dayan, executive editor from a very muggy Los Angeles, hottest day of the year uh, so far, uh, when it's 90 at the coast. This is, this is bad. So uh, from a climate change inflected uh, uh, Los Angeles, and with me from uh, Boston is uh, co-founder, editor, Robert Kuttner. Bob, how you doing? Doing well, and I'm actually on Cape Cod, where it's nice and cool. Oh, well, there you go. So the long and the short of it. Um, well, uh, we uh, took a summer Friday last week. So uh, the last time we did this was uh, right after the Democratic National Convention. Uh, now we are post-Labor Day. This is kind of the unofficial start of, of uh, the general election campaign season. Uh, this is when, uh, you know, most most campaigns see as their kickoff. Uh, so we're in the home stretch. We've got about eight, eight weeks to go or so. And, uh, you know, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, Kamala Harris uh, was up in New England, was up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, talking uh, about uh, economics and, and uh, particularly uh, a, a small business proposal that we can talk about. But the first part of that was that she uh, decided to uh, break with a series of um, proposals that she previously endorsed in the campaign, uh, which was, you know, previously she said, uh, I agree with all of the changes in the Biden budget on taxes. And now the context here, right, is that we're going to have this huge discussion about taxes in 2025. The Trump tax cuts for individual rates expire. And so under current law, uh, all of those individual taxes are going to go. Uh, Harris uh, has stuck to the Biden pledge that nobody making under $400,000 a year is going to get a tax increase. Uh, and that's going to cost trillions of dollars. So there are uh, compensatory plans to not only cover that amount, but to raise trillions of dollars more, some of which which can be put into expanding the child tax credit and, and some other programs that the administration or that the incoming Harris uh, it, potential administration wants to do. Um, and among those was a, a significant hike in the capital gains tax to actually equalize taxation on capital 
with taxation on income. Uh, they were both going to be 39.6% uh, plus a surcharge uh, that is from Medicare. And, uh, you know, she accepted this. She said, this is my plan. And then this week decided maybe not, maybe this isn't my plan. Uh, so, uh, Bob, you've been talking to some people about this. Tell us about uh, what you think here. Well, so <clears throat> to, to give her the benefit of the doubt, and I'm not sure I want to give her the benefit of the doubt, but you could say that, well, it's not all that much money, right? You pointed out in your own piece on this, David, that the that the that the uh, you know the fifty thousand uh, uh, dollar tax break for small businesses in the first year of their startup that's going right. to cost something like eleven eleven billion dollars over ten that's years. That's a separate right? a separate thing that right. we'll talk about later, but right. yes. And so the um, the two two of the three big Biden uh, plans, uh, the the uh, the, the capital gains increase and the so-called step up in basis where, where you don't get a tax loophole, your heirs don't get a tax loophole on, right. on capital gains. Basically, gains. if you have holdings that you never sold right. and you die, uh, the, the new cost basis for all of those holdings goes up to where it was the day you died. Right. And that saves a massive amount of money uh, right. Because you could hold, you could have, uh, you know, Apple at two dollars a share. It goes to right. like five hundred dollars a share, and then you die, and you pass that stock onto your heirs, and their basis is five hundred dollars a share. So they right. saved all of those capital gains. So the government has not costed out the difference between the Biden proposal to to raise the capital gains rate to uh, the rate on ordinary income. And the, and the now modified Harris proposal to max it out at 28%. But I right. talked to our, our friends at the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, and they said that the 10 year cost of this is order of magnitude $50, $50 billion. So mm -hmm. you could say, well, you know, that's not that much money. But on the other hand, I think there are three really serious things wrong with it. One, you alluded to it $50, $50 billion is not chump change. And we need to be raising trillions of dollars. And the only decent place to raise it from is rich people, because rich people have been walking off with such a large share of the total increment in G GDP. Right. Secondly, the problem is that even if it doesn't change very many votes among very, very rich people, given the pressure that her donors have been putting on her, it looks like she's caving into her rich donors. And right. that, that that looks like hell. And the third problem is that it, it reinforces the image of Kamala Harris as a flip-flopper. Uh, and of course, compared to Trump, uh, Kamala is, <laughs> is completely steadfast, but right. you don't want to give aid and comfort to the claim that, oh, she's just another flip-flopper. And of course, you have the situation where she changed her view on fracking. She w was originally for a fracking ban. Now right. she's not for a fracking ban. I actually think that's more defensible. I mean, I would rather have her uh, you know, have, have stood up and said, look, I've changed my views because I got to carry Pennsylvania because that's the right. reality. But right. instead, she said, well, we've made so many gains on climate that we can afford to, uh, you know, tolerate fracking. OK, that's it doesn't pass the Pinocchio test. But I think hmm. I, I think that's defensible politically. Right. I think uh, giving away uh, this capital gains break to people who are staggeringly rich, that's not even defensible politically. How many votes is right. it going to change? It makes her look like hell, both in terms of making her look like someone who's uh, caving into pressure from her donors and um, makes her look like a flip-flopper. So yeah. I don't... It, the latter I, thing, yeah, it, the it, latter it, thing was kind of my point. Um, you know, nobody put a gun to Kamala Harris's head and said, you have to accept all of the uh, elements of the Biden budget as far as taxation goes. She didn't have to do that. She could have right. come out later with a tax plan that is much like the tax plan now. There would have been no uh, ability to say, oh, she flip-flopped, she changed her vote or, or whatever. Or she could, have, she could have offset the 50 billion that we're going to lose by having a right, lower- Right, some other way. Some other way. But right. so I think it's, 
I, I think it's 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 not good politics. You can argue around the margin about what's good economics. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, it's you know she comes out and now says, well, actually, you know, I agree with everything in there, but. And it invites questions about every other aspect of that plan. The thing yeah. that's been kind of beaten up the most is this idea, I, I believe it's called a billionaire's minimum tax, this idea for a, a tax on unrealized capital gains. Um, and that's been taking a beating. And you can just see now that she's changed and lowered the rate of capital gains taxation, uh, that she's right to now have to change that. And, well, and, and it, it, you know, it's yeah, not and, a and, thing and, that's probably even going to ever pass Congress. Like it, it's, it, you know, she should have uh, done, figured out what she was going to do and then say it rather than adopt this very maximalist position and then, and then change it before we even get to the negotiation. Well, and in terms of really fundamental tax reform, radical tax reform, the, the two most radical parts of this are not raising the capital gains rate. Two most radical parts of this are taxing unrealized gains, which nobody's right. ever done. And secondarily, so-called stepped up basis, which is a really right. fundamental reform. And what's weird is that she appears to be sticking to those, but tweaking the, the, the top capital gains. Exactly. Rate, bizarre. So but it, it just feels like a prelude. It feels like a prelude because those other two things are going to be guarded much more zealously than a modest, uh, a modest change in the in the rate. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I personally, I think stepped up basis is a no brainer. Uh, that's this is a massive unearned tax break to air. Yeah, but it's politically, politically, it's a heavy lift. It is a heavy lift because, you know, there are a lot of rich people in Congress and then they all talk to a lot of rich people, too. So that's why it's a heavy lift. Uh, the, you know, the other thing that you can do that hasn't been uh, added to the debate is that you can say, well, this whole concept where uh, a mega rich person has a ton of assets, maybe in their own company, and then they borrow against those assets, use those assets as collateral, and then they die. Right. Uh, uh, there, there's a there's an argument to make that, OK, if you're borrowing against equity, we're going to tax that borrowing against equity. Um, uh, that hasn't been in the debate either. So instead, now what we have is these two things that are very politically heavy lifts. And she's already shown weakness on the easy thing or the easier thing, which is the rate. Uh, maybe she thought that the rate was more digestible to people like, yeah, we're going to give you know, people the ability to invest uh, at a lower rate, uh, et cetera. But I, I feel like there's blood in the water now well, around ex these other yeah, topics. Exactly. And so <clears throat> the calculus was, well, okay, let's throw a bone to our donors who've been complaining that we're too big on taxing the rich, but it's more like throwing chum at the fish. It's only going to attract. That's more. right. That's <laughs> right. I agree. Um, and, and then the other part of the speech, which you alluded to before, was this uh, new expanded tax break on startup companies and small businesses uh, for their startup costs. Uh, right now, you get to deduct something like $5,000 in startup costs, and she wants to raise it to 50000 This is not a huge tax break, as we said. Uh, the Biden administration, uh, there's also like the, the, the whole premise of it is we need more small business formation. And that's a mistaken premise. We've had a massive amount of small business formation in the last four years since the pandemic, 19 million new applications for startups. It's been a real under the radar success of the Biden administration. And they didn't need like a new tax break. Nobody was clamoring for a new tax break to do it. I'm sure small businesses will take it. It's free money. But there, there was no compelling kind of clamoring for this. I actually talked to uh, the Main Street Alliance and some of these other small business organizations. I looked at a bunch of surveys. If you ask small businesses, what is the biggest hindrance to what your, uh, you know, to your, your future success, it's access to credit. It's, it's the ability to have the working capital to start the business in the first place. Getting a tax break on expenses after the business has started is less impactful 
than getting the money up front to be able to start the business. And so I, I think there was a, a kind of a misguided look here at what it actually would take to make small businesses successful. Yeah, well, I mean, I wasn't in the room where these two policies were decided, but you can imagine the conversation, right? We have to do something symbolic to show that we really care about small business and we have to show our donors that we're not, you know, um, communists wanting to tax the filthy rich. So let's just shave off the capital gains rate. It's just, it, it's really bad politics because they did not think through the knock on yeah. effects. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. Uh, and it, it's, it shows a level of thinking where the policy is being driven by the politics. But it's uh, being driven by stupid politics. Yeah, it's, it's not good politics. Worst of both worlds. But it's, if, the, if, if the policy were being driven by the politics and it were astute politics, like maybe the fracking reversal is astute politics, right. you could say, right. okay, it's politics. But this is not even good politics. Right. Now, another looking to the other side, which also has been engaged in some, some bad politics of late, um, there's an opportunity here. Now, Congress comes back in session. They're obviously all they want to do is is pass a continuing resolution, get the government funded through the election and go home. But uh, Trump last week, and I wrote about this at the beginning of the week, came out saying, uh, you know, because he's getting hammered on abortion. Uh, he's been hammered on abortion for for months and months and months. He sees it as uh, a key reason why Republicans essentially did not do as well in 2022. Uh, it's it's a threat to his his victory. And so he came out and said uh, he, he was talking about IVF because, you know, the the, the whole idea of, uh, you know, banning abortion has bled into these other things like in vitro fertilization. And he said, well, we're going to have the government pay for IVF or we're going to mandate that uh, companies cover insurance yeah, companies fine. cover cover the process, right? Um, so the, the reality is that uh, the Senate voted on a thing called the Right to IVF Act in June, and uh, it included an insurance mandate for IVF. And uh, pretty much every Republican, except for Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, voted against it, including J.D. Vance, who, uh, you know, was actually present for that vote in the Senate and voted against it. So there is a pretty compelling case that Chuck Schumer should bring this bill up again and once again cause this wedge between what Trump is out there saying, trying to save his candidacy, and what Republicans are willing to do. And you can see it that even last week uh, when Lindsey Graham was on one of the Sunday shows and was asked about this, he said, well, I don't like I don't like uh, the uh, insurance mandates, but maybe we can do like some means tested tax credit. So they're tying themselves up in knots, like complete knots around this issue. And there is an opportunity here for uh, Schumer to twist the knife. Well, and meanwhile, the evangelicals are wildly upset with Trump. So right. There is no way of finessing. It's a no win situation for them. Yeah. Either they either Republicans go along with Trump and get the you know backlash from their you know, theocratic base or they uh, decide to break with Trump. And then, you know, it's dissension within the Republican ranks. So uh, I think there's a, a real opportunity there and we'll see what happens. I got kind of a noncommittal response from Schumer's office when I asked him about it, but uh, we'll see what happens. I, I, I think there are some, there's a decent chance that that is what they'll do to highlight this once again. So um, David, yeah. I have, I've been working on two things. I've been working on the issue of turnout and I've yeah. been working on uh, the issue of voter suppression. So uh, I was getting to that. So why don't we just kick that off right now? Go ahead. So I think a lot of uh, Democrats have been mystified and disheartened by the fact that even though we had all this energy and this unity at the convention, we're not seeing more than a trivial bounce in the polls. So I started uh, digging into that. And one source of comfort, although you have to be very careful in, in parsing this, is the fact that the big variable that ex has explained uh, relative Democratic success in the last three elections is turnout. 
that uh, when you have a high turnout election, other things being equal and other things are always not equal, but when you have a high turnout election, there's more of an upside among potential Democratic voters or so-called low propensity voters, uh, African-Americans, young people, to some extent, single women. And when you have um, a high turnout election, that tends to help Democrats more than it helps Republicans. Now, we we're, it's too early to see evidence of that. But what you do right. see evidence of is the fact that all of the activists who were energized by the convention and by Harris succeeding Biden as the candidate are now going to go out and redouble their efforts to register yeah. people and get people to vote early and get people to vote by mail. And that's going to boost turnout. And because Trump has been so contemptuous of what other Republican candidates would see as really important on the ground election infrastructure. He doesn't have that. He thinks that the, the way you boost uh, excitement is just by doing all these rallies. And they right. don't begin to have anything on the Republican side that um, that matches all the activism uh, on the ground. That well, let, let's break that down. Because I want to I want to push I want to push back on that just a little bit. Um, I think there are metrics where that is absolutely correct. You look at it in money. Uh, I believe the Harris campaign announced uh, today that they er, they took in over three hundred and fifty million dollars in August. Uh, so you look at it on that metric, and a lot of that is low dollar money. You look at it in volunteers. You see all these, uh, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> white dudes for Harris, uh, engineers for Harris, whatever. Um, you see that excitement, you see it in volunteers, um, it, on those metrics, it does appear to be an advantage. However, the other thing about 2016 and 2020 is that Trump largely defied the polls in terms of their turnout models. And what he did was he did actually bring people out who were low propensity voters <clears throat> in rural areas, right? Uh, and uh, people who had sort of come out of the woodwork, who had never voted before, and who wouldn't vote for anybody but Trump, because we didn't see this in 2018 or 2022. But in 16 and 20, when Trump was on the ballot, these people came out of the woodwork and decided to vote for Trump. Uh, now, uh, so, you know, and I think you talked to some people about that, right? Right. Well, I, I, I think um, in terms of these low propensity voters who will come out and vote for Trump, Trump has pretty well maxed out with that demographic. And right. although the conventional wisdom that um, the upside for Democrats is better uh, than for Republicans in a, in a low, in a, in a high turnout election, that absolutely has to be qualified by the point that you just made. But there is still a margin <clears throat> where Democrats are likely to do better uh, in an election where their volunteers are motivated and they're going to be beating the bushes uh, to get people to register and get people to uh, vote early and get people to come to the polls. So it's yeah. it's not a total slam dunk, but I think even if you, you drill down and look at this, uh, on net, if you can assume a lot of activism on the Democratic side, which I think you can, uh, uh, turnout on balance uh, favors Democrats, but then the uh, offset, of course, I, I, is, now, is now. No, wait. Let Let's Let's get to voter suppression in a minute because yeah, I, I still yeah, want to stay with right. this. I still want to stay with this. Uh, I'm willing to believe that Trump has maxed out on the turnout side. That everyone who uh, has ever been a non-voter who only comes out for Trump has already right. done that in the past two elections. I'm I'm willing to believe that. I, what I don't know is whether pollsters have put that into their models, right? Do they Are they accounting for this usual surge when Trump is the nominee of these lower propensity voters on the right? That's the question to me, it's, because it's, it's, it, it matters for what the polls that we're seeing right now. It's unknowable at this stage of the game. Because you, you will not know until later in the fall right. uh, what the increase in voter registration actually is. And right. so even if you put it in a model, the model is only as good as its assumptions. And right. uh, 
turn out maybe. That's, my, just, that's really my question. My yeah. question is the assumption. Uh, the other part of this that I've seen some reporting on, and I think you know we need more of it, is that Trump has essentially outsourced his get out the vote operation right. to these uh, uh, conservative groups. Uh, they're not like paid by the campaign uh, directly. Uh, they're not direct employees of the campaign, but they're people like Charlie Kirk's, uh, uh, I forget the name of his project, but um, they're, they're, they're these outside groups that have never really done turnout in a national election before. <laughs> You might remember uh, in 2012, Mitt Romney had created what is what was alleged to be this great turnout model and it was using technology. Yeah, Turning Point, thank you, uh, our behind the scenes producer here. Turning Point USA is the Charlie Kirk uh, uh, organization. And they're doing a lot of the get out the vote. Uh, as I said, in 2012, Mitt Romney said, I have this great technology to get out the vote and it totally crashed on election day. It didn't work at all. And it was a factor in in Republicans not being able to hit their turnout numbers. Here, this is being outsourced to people who have no experience turning people out. And it's just sort of, trust me, this was at the heart of how the RNC, Ronna McDaniel, got thrown out uh, as the chair of the RNC in favor of, uh, I think, Trump's daughter-in-law and, and some other dude. Uh, it's because they wanted to empower Turning Point USA and some of these other conservative groups to do the, the get out the vote for them. This is a very under the radar factor. I mean, ground game doesn't always shape an election, but it can be a couple points on the margins. And in an election this close, a couple points is all you need. Yeah, exactly. And of course, if you look at the excitement factor, the way this plays out, <clears throat> you need the volunteers, you need the party professionals. You need the people who really get into this if they're excited to then go and out. Who and who know how to do it? Work. Who know, how, know how, to how to do it? it. It's not just random people. And, and, like and I'm these... hearing stories. I'm hearing stories about outside groups who are inundating the swing states with mailers right now. Uh, people getting like two and three mailers about Trump every day, and they're registered longtime Democrats who will never vote for Trump. It's yeah. a total waste of money, and Good. it speaks to these these uh, very uh, unexperienced, inexperienced groups who are running these kinds of turnout campaigns. Yeah, and uh, so it's it's a quiet part of this, but I think it's an important part. Yeah. So right. so let's get to the voter suppression thing. Yeah. Because so that was the, the other thing you wrote about the other offset is voter suppression, and and. Um, it really breaks into two categories, one of which is not all that bad, the other of which could be really problematic. So the first category is the voter suppression techniques that we all know and love from, from 2020, uh, purges and uh, ridiculous ID sure. requirements and uh, you know harassing people who are trying to help people vote and you know a, a dozen things. Um, that has pretty well been damped down at least in the uh, in the seven crucial states where you have mm -hmm. uh, five of them run by Democrats. Uh, the, the 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 sixth one is Nevada, where you have a Repub a Democratic uh, AG, a Democratic uh, uh, Secretary of the Secretary State, of state. Yeah. and a and a, Re and a Republican governor who's not a Trumpy, and then the seventh state is Georgia, where you have. Uh, camp completely at swords points with the Trumpies, uh, right. trying to to fire the, uh, you know, this insane electoral commission, and so we're almost and seven the secretary of, the secretary of state as well, right? Yeah, Raffensperger yeah. was yeah, yeah. yeah. So in terms of the the key swing states, we're almost seven for seven in terms right. of state government not being in favor of that kind of voter suppression. However, right. and there are two big howevers. First of all, there's all the down ballot stuff, beginning with six very tight Senate races. And right. some of those Senate races are in red states. So if you have voter suppression. Montana, um, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and um, Florida, where you have a very unpopular sitting senator, Rick Scott, potentially uh, we could pick that seat up. But there's a lot of voter suppression in Florida. There's even more voter suppression in Texas, where maybe in a fair fight. 
um, all red could could knock off Cruz. So, and right. then you have all the other down ballot stuff. You also have um, a county level uh, nastiness, and uh, the, the the sleeper here is efforts to delay the count and delay certification, right. which can be done at the county level, both by having county commissioners delay the certification, which then affects the statewide certification. And even more nefariously, you've got a lot of violence where Trump has psyched the craziest people in his base up to believe that the election has already been stolen even before it starts. And so you're going to have vigilantes descending on county courthouses, intimidating the people, the professional election right. workers. You, you even have a plot to have them get jobs as election workers. And then on top of that, you, you've got... Guys like Ken Paxton, the Attorney General of Texas, uh, in this whole effort to reopen alleged voting fraud cases from 2022, which have been cold for a year and a half, as a mm -hmm. way of sending a signal to Hispanic voters in four counties that if you fail mm -hmm. to dot an I or cross a T, you're going to end up in jail. And one of the experts I talked to referred to this with a lovely term. It, this is promoting self-suppression. So you right. don't suppress the voters, but you intimidate the voters so that they're too scared to vote. So right. that's the sleeper. So it's not yeah. like it's not like voting suppression has gone away. It's taking different forms. And it's it's probably OK in the seven swing states uh, where the presidency is going to be decided. But in order for Harris to be an effective president to govern, she needs a trifecta. And this could mess right. up the Senate, be mess up the House. So that's my net net. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're starting to see polls out of Montana that are really not good for John no. Tester. Um, yep. And if you if you sort of write off that, uh, there, there aren't a lot of pieces on the board that are available. And as you say, two of the only pieces left for Democrats would be to pick up seats in Florida or Texas where this type of, you know, if voting is speech, then this is self-censorship. This kind of thing is going to be uh, at the top of the list. And and those machineries are all controlled by Republicans. Uh, they're they're going to do uh, their utmost to kind of it, it's I mean, it really is a form of suppression, but it's kind of a form of of suppression where. Uh, it, it's a bit more hands off. Right. Uh, the direct suppression is you need an ID. We're going to throw out your vote because it's a provisional ballot or whatever. This is we're going to make you so scared uh, to, to vote that you're not going to do it. And so we're going to literally suppress your ability to vote by scaring you. Yeah. Now, the good thing about Florida is you've got abortion on the ballot. And so right. that could bring out a lot of uh you know, potential uh, uh, anti-Scott voters. So that you, that you, might be close. You also have it on the ballot in Montana. Uh, in fact, there are 10 states where abortion is on the ballot, including Montana, uh, where it's actually, uh, abortion is generally legal in Montana now, and this would codify it. Um, you also have uh, an interesting situation in Nebraska, where and we wrote about this this week gabrielle Gurley wrote about it there are actually two abortion ballot measures on the ballot in nebraska one would tighten up uh to uh, i believe a six-week ban and the other would uh uh allow for abortion at the point of viability fetal viability up until that point um so whatever ballot measure gets more votes will win essentially. And there are now these legal machinations to try to throw one or both off of the ballot because of something very obscure in Nebraska's constitution called the single subject rule. Uh, and so they're, they're trying to say that these ballot measures, and particularly the pro-abortion rights ballot measure, violates that rule. Um, but even if one of them is on the ballot, uh, you know, it's going to draw people out. And here's why Nebraska is interesting, right? So uh, Nebraska apportions its electoral votes by district. And in 2020, uh, Joe Biden won 
the second district of Nebraska. It's basically Omaha, which is a little more liberal. It's it's a, a mostly a, a toss up district. Uh, Republican controls the House seat right now, but he, uh, polling has shown Harris winning that district. They've spent a lot more money. Actually, I don't think Trump has spent any money in that district, and and Harris has spent millions. They've sent Tim Walls, who is a native Nebraskan, to that district. Um, and uh, the polling shows them ahead and also shows the Democrat running for the House ahead in that district. That one electoral vote sounds like nothing, but is actually extremely important because if you have the uh, blue wall states hold and, uh, and Harris loses Nevada, uh, uh Arizona, Georgia, and North Carolina, Harris still wins, but only if she gets that blue dot, only if she gets that one electoral vote. Otherwise, and, it's 269, 269. And also, by the way, if if I'm up on this story, the Republican effort to get the governor to call a special section to have statewide electoral voting, that failed. So that they did fail. That Not only did that fail, but uh, the state of Maine, which also apportions by electoral, uh, by by congressional district, came out and said, if you change Nebraska, your way of apportioning electoral votes, we're going to do the same thing. And that matters because Trump has in the past won the second district of Maine, which is a, a swing seat. Uh, and, and he's won that in the past. So it would be a it would sort of be a, a flip if. Uh, if if Nebraska went ahead and tried to do that, so so it's it, still in play. Is isn't it Nebraska where there's an independent Senate candidate? Yeah, let's also talk about that. So, uh, and we're going to have some reporting on this. Emma Jansen, our uh, our our writing fellow, is is readying a piece right now that'll probably be out Monday. Um, but yes, there is an independent uh, guy by the name of Dan Osborne, uh, who is uh, a former union organizer. He worked at Kellogg and he organized a, uh, a strike uh, against Kellogg that ended up, uh, you know, uh, being successful for the union. Um, and he's running against Deb Fisher, who's a, uh, a incumbent Republican. And the polls have been weird all year on this seat. So Fisher's internals show her up by 25 and uh, Osborne has put out internals showing it tied. So somebody was really, really wrong, right? And uh, a, an independent poll came out just this uh, in the last week that shows actually Osborne's right. It is pretty much a tied race. And so and my my sleeper reason for this uh, that I don't think a lot of people have talked about is that it is Osborne's last name. So uh, uh, Osborne is a name of political and more important uh, uh, football royalty in the state of Nebraska. Dr. Tom Osborne was the coach of the University of Nebraska football team that won several national titles in the 80s. He then went into politics. He served three terms as uh, the the House uh, as a House member from Nebraska, and then lost uh, a gubernatorial election back in 2006. He's still alive. He's like 87 years old or something. Um, I, I'll be willing to bet that there are a lot of people in Nebraska who think Dan Osborne is related to Tom Osborne. Uh, now, they actually spell their names differently. Os Tom, Dr. Tom Osborne has an E. Dan Osborne doesn't have an E at the end of his last name. But I guarantee you that's some of what's going on, that, that there's an assumed familial relationship. And I wouldn't be surprised if Deb Fisher ran an ad with Republican Dr. Tom Osborne at some point saying, this isn't my son. <laughs> this isn't, uh, I'm not related to this guy. And I endorse Deb Fisher. Is this a dig um, against Nebraska's literacy? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think this happens all the time, right? Uh, it, two years ago, um, uh, Summer Lee, the uh, Democratic uh, squad member from Pitt Pittsburgh, was running for her seat. She was trying to replace a guy named Mike Doyle, who was in Congress for, I don't know, 20 years, right? And the Republicans ended up running a guy named Mike Doyle against Summer Lee. And she was she was threatened in that race, even though it's a very blue seat, because people probably looked at it and said, yeah, Mike Doyle. I know Mike Doyle. I'll vote for Mike Doyle. 
is a different guy. Yeah. Um, so this happens a lot. I mean, this yeah. is not this is not abnormal. Um, but that Nebraska seat is really, really interesting because more to the point, Osborne is running uh, as an independent. He's running a populist campaign. He's running on union rights. He's uh, running against sort of the status quo Republicanism that pervades Nebraska. And he's, I mean, I don't think it's all because of the Dr. Tom Osborne name thing. I think he's getting some adherence. So it, it could, it's a really interesting race. And we're going to have a very well, good a, piece. There's a lot of, that. I mean, you know, William Shenny's Bryan. I mean, there's a lot of, was Nebraska. And there's a lot of latent populism still a century later in a lot of these Midwestern and Western states. Yes. And what we're starting to see is uh, people running either as an independent, in the case of Osborne, Democrats aren't running a candidate in Nebraska. It's only the only two on the ballot will be Fisher and Osborne. Uh, there's no other candidate on the ballot. Um, so whether they're running as an independent or running as Democrats, we're starting to see candidates try populism in these red areas to see if that can attract a, a different breed of, uh, you know, people who maybe have maybe voted Democrat in the past and moved away from the party. Uh, the, that's what this story, I'm previewing it now, but that's what the story is going to be about. Uh, there's a candidate um, in uh, North Dakota who is actually running that kind of a campaign and uh, as well, Lucas Kuntz, who you and I both know, uh, right. running in Missouri against Josh Hawley, uh, definitely on those populist issues. Uh, well, and well. Hawley so, purports to be a kind of a populist. I mean, the, yeah. the, the states are coming back to their, you know, 30 years ago, they all sent populist Democrats to Congress. It's not that long ago. Right. Absolutely. Um all right. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left. We have a couple more things I wanted to cover. Um, the first thing is, I don't know if you saw this. We haven't talked about this, but um, uh, so Trump went to the New York Economic Club yesterday. Um, and uh, he basically, I mean, you know, as, as much as Trump can, he laid out his economic vision uh, for the country. And his economic vision is really focused on uh, tariffs and not just not just targeted tariffs, but these across the board, 10 percent, 20 percent, maybe even higher tariffs on all goods coming into the country. And he thinks he's going to make so much money off of these tariffs that it will pay for everything that uh, under the sun. He was asked about child care. He's like, well, the tariffs will make so much money. Child care is nothing. We can we can handle that. Uh, with all this tariff money that's going to be coming in. Now, you obviously have 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 looked at trade issues for forever, and I'm sure you have some some you know ideas on whether going back to the era of William McKinley is a good idea or not. So, um, high tariffs for their own sake are a really dumb idea because you're you're increasing uh, the cost of purchasing everything. However, it's essentially a tax. It's a tax yeah, on it, all goods. Paid, paid by consumers. However, uh, selective tariffs married to an industrial policy, that's smart, going back to Alexander Hamilton. And um, and to some extent... Um, and that's, that's what Biden's been doing, right? Yeah. That's, that's what I was going to say. Biden's been doing that. And specifically, when you have a, a, a foreign country that is violating all the rules of the trading system... Then you have targeted tariffs against that foreign country, in this case, China. And what's interesting is that the, the Trump version of the China tariffs, of the architect of which was uh, Bob Lighthizer, who I often refer to as Trump's only good appointee, um, was not married to any kind of domestic program. That fell to Biden. And so right. uh, even Lighthizer's program was just purely negative it was 25 percent. So, so, yeah, I mean, what, what you're saying is like in Trump's term, he was putting these targeted tariffs in but and not doing any. doing nothing on the domestic side, just assuming like, oh, if there are tariffs, then companies will somehow by their own volition spring up and produce the goods that won't yeah, be yeah. coming over from other countries. Uh, what Biden has done is said, actually, we're going to we're going to do very direct strategies to rebuild our industrial base in America yeah. 
Uh, and uh, if we combine that with some targeted tariffs, then we're yeah. going to create a situation where uh, uh, we can we can actually uh, you know rebuild a manufacturing. Base. Yeah, and, and so I can just imagine how that speech went down with most of the people who were members of the New York Economic Club. I mean, this is the last thing in the world that the Republican uh, right. establishment wants because A, the Republican establishment doesn't believe in industrial policy. B, the Republican establishment likes doing outsourcing. And if you do outsourcing, there's suddenly a 20% or 10%, whatever it is, tax when you try to bring back those inputs or goods into the United States. So right. I'm sure he alienated almost all of the audience. And to the extent that there are some people who are supporters of tariffs when they are linked to industrial policy, he didn't even do that. So right. there's nobody who it, supports this. It's a good point that it's not just, you're not just talking about finished goods. We're talking about inputs. And right. even when you're building in America, until we have our supply chains up for things like solar production, for things right. like, uh, you know, the, the, the minerals that you need uh, to make lithium ion batteries or whatever, we're going to have to source those inputs from somewhere. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the administration has put together this kind of concept of friend shoring where we do it uh, from companies that are friendly to our interests. Um, but you're going to have to do it from somewhere. And if you do across the board tariffs, then forget friend shoring. Uh, and even if you're making things for Amer in America, they're going to be more expensive to make because you have to source some of the key critical inputs from yeah, overseas. He, he, he's like a kid with a shiny new object and tariffs are going to be the panacea for everything. And <clears> nobody <throat> can do that. Not left, not right, not center. He's all by himself. Right. And the calculation is, is crazy because, you know, the whole idea here is that we're going to make so much money. He, he actually literally sees it as a money-making program. I mean, I think almost more than than rebuilding uh, jobs and industrial policy in the U.S., he sees it as, oh, I can just charge everybody 20 percent. I can take that money. And I mean, I'm sure he does this in his hotels. He just charges, you know, it's like a junk fee. He charges 20 percent and then he gives it to himself. But here he's trying to do that to the whole world uh, on on tariffs. And and what they'll do is say, well, we're not send we won't send the goods because we won't pay that tariff. So uh, you obviously get less uh, trade as a result of that. And yeah. uh, you're not backing it up by increasing you know, homemade manufacturing. So the interesting question to me politically is whether anybody is going to vote for Trump based on this. And conversely, is anybody going to vote against Trump based on this? I mean, does his economic program matter electorally at all? Yeah, I I, I mean, do, does any policy matter at all when you're talking about an election? I mean, it may, it uh, may that's why I think I mean, to get back to what we were saying at the beginning, that's why I think optics, that's why I think, you know, uh, something like where Harris adopts the entire tax policy of the Biden administration and then says, oh, but not that and not that and not that, that that gives you a, a I mean, it's maybe it's unfair, but people see that and they look at someone's leadership and it's like, you just accepted that a week ago and now you're changing your mind. And, you know, is this the kind of erratic behavior that I want to endorse? So, but, but let's let's relate this to the debate, which we have not talked about yet. Yeah, the debate is so, Tuesday. Yeah, right. So if Harris, so if you were coaching Harris um, mm -hmm. in the debate, would you coach her to point out how completely screwball the Trump proposal on tariffs is? Or is that just not salient enough? I mean, I think I think in all these things, you have to play it back to values. Right. So uh, for me, yes, you can talk about that, how this makes absolutely no sense on any kind of economic level. But you have to put that back into this is an erratic guy who has insane policy ideas and uh, he's going to bankrupt the country. I mean, whatever, however you yeah, want it, to frame it, that, it's one, it's, but it's, you have it, to. It's one more manifestation of the fact that Trump is a crackpot. And that right. has to be you the have theme to, over you have to and over. Bring over. It, yep. You have to bring it back to that. That would be my, I mean, look, I'm not a debate prepper, but that would be my advice is that, you you know, bring it back to your main theme. Keep hammering that main theme. 
this guy's weird. That's a weird idea. I mean, if you want to do it that way. Well, look, uh, you know, I've interviewed Kamala Harris in the past. Uh, I've obviously seen her in in interviews. Uh, I've seen her in debates. Uh, The last probably the last debate she did was in uh, what would that have been? 2016. She did. She did a couple of debates here. Well, she, did a, the she did a vice. She did one vice presidential debate against right, against Pence. which I don't really remember too much. It was pretty low key. Um, but what I do remember are, you know, she debated Loretta Sanchez when she was running for Senate, and Loretta Sanchez was kind of, you know, everybody kind of knew she wasn't going to win. Um, but she also debated Steve Cooley. Steve Cooley in 2010 was running for attorney general. He was the very popular district attorney of Los Angeles. And uh, he was actually favored to win that race. This was 2010. Schwarzenegger wasn't too long ago. There was still a chance for a moderate Republican to win in California. And he was looking to win. He was ahead in the polls. They did a debate and he was asked a question about... um, uh, basically, if he left the uh, office of the district attorney to become attorney general, he would be eligible for a pension from the city of Los Angeles. And he was asked about that. This was a time when there were these uh, stories about runaway pensions in cities all around L.A. County. And he said, yeah, I'll take that pension because I earned it. And and the brilliance of what Harris did, not only did she cut that 30 seconds into an ad and that ad probably won her the race, but in the moment she let him dig his own grave. She let him say that. And uh, she didn't, she didn't step, but she's like, you heard him. I, I think that's actually what she said <laughs> after, after Cooley said that uh, she allowed that to happen. I think there'll be moments in this debate uh, with Trump, where she can just point to listen to what you just heard, right? Right. You know, let's break that down. What you just heard this guy say, and uh, uh, you know, she can take that and and use it as fodder. I, I think you know that that little moment in 2010 that I remember very vividly um, is is a good example for for the kind of thing she can do. Um, okay. So uh, I got one last thing on my list. Uh, I wrote about this today. Um, uh, I was at the DNC uh, and on the final day, uh, they had uh, this this kid who I had interviewed before, a guy named Nathan Horns, who was a victim of Corinthian colleges. He was a a defrauded for-profit college student. He went on stage. He said, you know, Kamala Harris helped shut down Corinthian colleges when she was attorney general of California. Kamala Harris helped as vice president get all of the Corinthian loans forgiven. And so I thank her for for helping us have a brighter future. I remember that, uh, you know, that was a, that was a big moment for the, the student debt relief movement to have a, a for profit college student who was defrauded on stage at the Democratic National Convention. Well, turns out yesterday uh, a lawsuit is dropped accusing uh, Mohela, which is uh, a servicer. Basically, these student loans, they're all issued by the government. Then we have private companies collect the money and do day to day operations on all these loans. So the government said, we're canceling all the Corinthian loans. This was two years ago. They said this. We're going to cancel all these Corinthian loans. They sent letters to every Corinthian students saying, we're going to cancel your loans. We're going to refund you all the money you paid on that loan. And uh, this is going to happen. Mohela is the company that has to execute that. And they just haven't done it. So not only do they continue to ask for money for these loans that have been canceled, they continue to send them the credit agencies, meaning they're in default and, uh, you know, it hurts people's credit scores. And they continue to pursue debt collection on these particular loans. And uh, so this is a real embarrassment for Harris, who elevated this whole thing about defending for-profit college students. And it turns out it's all on paper that they canceled these loans. In reality, these loans are still alive. And so the students are saying, 
look, you were told to cancel the loans, Mohela. You haven't done it. We're suing you. So whose responsibility in the government is it to follow through on the statement that the loans are being canceled? It's the Department of Education, particularly the Office of Federal Student Aid. And so who screwed up? Yeah. So, I mean, I think in talking to some people, I think it's a combination of Mohela being completely unequipped to do pretty much anything when it comes to servicing student loans. And And this has been true time and time again. They have been sanctioned for not following the rules. They've been sued in class action suits multiple times. They've had payments withheld by the government, although eventually those payments got through. They got $300 million of taxpayer money in 2023. Um, so part of it is just Mahela is a terrible operator. But but the other part of it is they work that for the government. they work for the government. The government can fire them. The government can mandate that they do things the right way. And they just haven't done it. And there's more of an interest in getting a big headline number and announcing it in a showy press yeah. conference than actually doing the hard work of implementing the, the, the announcement. And that's the problem. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 the reform, I mean, we can have a long conversation about the ultimate reform of the student loan program, but as long as you're going to have student debt at all, you should do what Social Security does and just have the government administer the damn thing directly. Why do you need all these third party contractors? We uh, don't even control. hundred percent. Yeah. The, the, the I, U.S. government, I mean, if you think about it, the biggest agency in the world that collects payments is the Internal Revenue Service. Yeah, and they don't. Why do you need? Why do you need to outsource this little payment collection to private companies that have shown no ability to do the job? When yeah. you have the IRS sitting right there that can just, you know, bill people and take the money. It's a public option, Dave. We got about three more minutes. I I want to raise one other issue right. that we can't possibly solve in three minutes that I've written about. That's, that's the issue of Israel. And um, <laughs> Three minutes for that? Okay. Yeah, well, a minute and it. a half. Uh, <laughs> here's the minute and a half. I would like to see uh, Harris take a much harder line on Netanyahu. On the other hand, I think, um, <laughs> as we used to say in the days of bomb shelter drills, I think her strategy between now and the election has been duck and cover, and that's the right strategy, because there's no way she can win uh, by, uh, you know, tweaking the administration's stance towards Israel, which is, isn't even her province. I do think the one disgraceful thing that they did that shows how averse they are to doing anything on this was not letting two Palestinian-American state legislators who wanted to speak, speak at the convention. And um, the one speech by the woman who was a Palestinian-American state legislator in, in Georgia was yeah. about as tame as you could possibly imagine. It it, it basically yeah. said, I, I grieve for my relatives and relatives of my friends yeah. who've been killed in these horrible raids on Gazan civilians, but Trump hates me because I'm a Muslim and Kamala can have a much better chance at brokering a ceasefire right. and we all need to unite and vote for Kamala. Even that was too much for the people who were vetting these speeches. Every single speech at the convention was vetted. You had a swear in blood yeah. that you would not depart from the teleprompter. And this would have gone down very nicely in Michigan. It would not have scared off one Jewish vote. And they were still too risk averse on this. So I, I, I completely agree with you. I, I was there talking to delegates who engaged in a sit in outside the United Center in Chicago right. uh, because of the refusal to allow a Palestinian uh, American to speak. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not endorsing this, but I think what they were afraid of is that there would be five seconds of a speaker that said, I am a Palestinian American, and then 25 seconds in an ad of, uh, you know, Hamas, uh, uh, you know, right. engaging in, in killing of, of Israel, yeah, right. Israelis. So that's what they're afraid of. I'm not endorsing that. I agree with you. No. Um, uh, but I hope but, that when she's elected, uh, we get a change policy. Yeah. I mean, I think she's in the very same tough spot that Hubert Humphrey was in in 1968. So, uh, you know, uh, people were telling him to, to break with Johnson on Vietnam. He was the sitting vice president. 
He didn't want to do that. He did it late and it ended up being, you know, ineffectual point. to win the race. Yep. Uh, if he broke earlier, he probably would have won the race. Um, Harris has, you know, I mean, the thing she did this week, she, she was willing to do is she broke with Biden on, on capital gains tax rates. <laughs> Courageous. You know? Imagine if she imagine if she would have broke with Biden on, on uh, you know, at least even a small amount on the Israel issue. I think it, it would have helped in, in certain states. So, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. We got eight weeks to go. Uh, Bob Kuttner, thank you very much for being here. We do this uh, every Friday, uh, 1230 Eastern. Uh, and we will have an archive of this up on the site, as we always do. Uh, you can check out the weekly roundup this weekend. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a great rest of your day.